All right, recording started. Are you able to share your screen? Uh, why don't we get going? Okay. Well, hello, everybody. Uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, my name is Jeff Palmer. I am the Upper Midwest Regional Technical Manager for ArborJet uh, based out of Minnesota. I'm looking out in my backyard, and there's about two feet of snow. And I hear it's pretty nice out northeast, um, but hopefully it's nice where you are. And we're all thinking about spring, and so is Emerald Ash Borer. So we're going to talk about Emerald Ash Borer control. Uh, I'm also going to talk about several management options and what goes into the decisions of um, uh, your strategy for managing Emerald Ash Borer. So it can be quite a political topic, um, not always what's best about the tree, so I'll try to stay out of the weeds and make it nice and straightforward and talk mainly about the control of EAB and, and what your decision-making process is. So. Get started. Hopefully you can all see my screen. Uh, emerald ash borer, that's the adult insect on my finger, so not very large. Uh, that's on the left, and on the right is the tree damaging phase, which is the larval stage, and that's uh, something you'll never see unless you peel away the bark and look inside the ash tree. Um, but that's the stage of the insect that's doing all the damage to the trees, cutting off its uh, ability to translocate water. Uh, there's an awful lot of ash trees. North American ash trees are not uh, have never seen this pest prior to the late 1980s or right around 1990 when it was introduced to this country. It was identified in 2002 in Detroit area. Uh, a native of Asia, it is um, the trees in Asia are used to this bug, so they've developed some natural defenses towards it where our trees have not, and that's why it's such a big problem. It's moving through our country fairly rapidly because it has a lot of food and uh, it affects nearly every single ash tree it comes into contact with. Uh, most of our uh, native species of ash, green ash, white ash, black ash, blue ash, pumpkin ash are all susceptible to EAB. The, uh, the, in order to control a, a pest, you need to know a little bit about its life cycle. So I won't spend a lot of time on this, but uh, it's just important to know that this insect has uh, generally one generation per year. In other words, it does not have multiple uh, hatch-outs every season. Uh, the larva will do the feeding during the summertime uh, throughout the season. And then uh, towards fall, it'll go into a pupil chamber and it turns into an adult. And uh, when it's warm enough in the springtime and early summer, it chews out of the tree as an adult insect mates and starts the life cycle once again. It's important to know this because many of the insects that we do have to deal with have multiple generations uh, every season. Something like an aphid or a white fly or a scale might have multiple generations, and that makes them a little harder to control. It also makes them more likely to develop a resistance to a pesticide. In this case, this is a fairly easy insect to control. Uh, there's a map of the national locations that emerald ash borer has been found. The red dots are the first find in every county. The white outline is a quarantine county, or some states are entirely quarantined. And the reason that the, the uh, United States uh, USDA puts those quarantines in place is to try to limit the movement of uh, emerald ash borer, because it is primarily transported by moving wood products or as adult insects. And uh, I have actually had adult EABs on my person when I've gotten into my car. So if I've done that, I know that other people have as well. And it's probably ridden uh, as a hitchhiker on the outside of vehicles many places. Because you notice there's a find out in Boulder, Colorado, that's as far west as EAB goes. And that's several hundred miles from the next nearest find. The only way EAB got there is people moved it around. So it's pretty well distributed throughout the eastern part of the country. Uh, a couple of notable states that it has not been detected yet in uh, Maine and, and Vermont. However, that does not mean that it's not there. It's just real difficult to detect, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Usually when we do find emerald ash borer, it's been in the area for three or four years at a min minimum. Uh, it does not do enough damage to the trees in the early infestations to notice symptoms. And so usually when we find EAB, it's already been there for about three or four years. We don't notice a lot of uh, trees dying right away. It takes several years for the uh, insect populations to build up, and then the trees start dying exponentially. And so oftentimes people kind of get lulled into sleep, um, say, oh, we found emerald ash borer in our area, but yet we don't see a whole lot of trees dying. 
that doesn't mean much. It just means that the populations are building, and at some point they become um, just so overwhelming that just large numbers of trees die. Uh, so what that means for cities, municipalities that have to deal with the uh, emerald ash borer that have maybe thousands of trees, that their um, budget would spike if they were not to do anything until that period when many, many trees started dying. So I guess the moral of the story is don't get lulled to sleep. If you're in an area where emerald ash borer is just now coming into, uh, it does take some time, but at, at a certain point they'll ramp up exponentially and the trees will start dying. So I'm often asked, how do you detect emerald ash borer early? And uh, these are some of the symptoms that you're going to uh, see. The easiest two symptoms to look for early are bark splits and woodpecker flakes. The woodpeckers know that the insects are inside the tree, so they peck away at the bark and um, flake off the bark, and then they'll peck inside and get the insect out. Uh, that's a good early indicator. <clears throat> And when I say early, it's not very early. It's usually that the insect has been there at least two or three years so that the populations have built up. Another early indicator might be in a vertical bark split because the tree is growing rapidly where uh, around emerald ash borer, but where EAB has made a entrance into the tree, the tree compartmentalizes that and dies, and that, thus creating this bark split that you might peel away. And if you see that serpentine back and forth gallery, that is emerald ash borer in an ash tree. Uh, they also make a D-shaped exit hole when they emerge. However, you're unlikely to see many of these at the um, eye level as the bark is really rough and the insect is fairly small. So again, woodpecker flaking is a good <clears throat> thing to look for this time of the year before the leaves are on the trees. Look in the upper canopy to mid, mid canopy. Uh, look for where the tree has been blonded and look for where the woodpeckers have dug in to get the insects out. And then again, bark splits, good, good time of the year to look for those as well. <clears throat> During the summer, we look at canopy thinning and we rate the trees based on uh, the, the thinning of the crown. Uh, emerald ash borer tends to feed on the entire crown um, kind of evenly, uh, beginning mid-crown or higher, and then it'll attack all the branches. So it's not killing one branch at a time, rather it's causing the entire top of the tree to decline. And so we rate these trees based on canopy thinning, your ability to see through the crown. And uh, online, there's a good canopy thinning guide. I have a picture of that on the lower left um, that basically rates the tree from 0% canopy thinning to 100% um, canopy thinning. And uh, some of the pictures that I've taken just give you some broad strokes of everything in between. You'll also notice that there are some unusual branch sprouting from the main part of the trunk, and that would be easily seen in this lower right picture. That's epicormic sprouting, and it's not doesn't happen all the time, but it's very common among ash trees. The tree's in trouble above it, and so it activates dormant buds and then pushes out new growth. Um, so these are all indicators that you might have emerald ash borer, and some, some of the rating systems that we use for canopy thinning help us when we're treating trees, too. There are other native insects in ash trees, and so you don't want to confuse native borers for emerald ash borer. Uh, I've got a picture of a clear, clear wing borer coming out of a tree. You'll never see the exoskeleton of the insect coming out of the tree like that. Uh, these holes are also much larger than emerald ash borer, and they push sawdust out, outside of the tree as they're emerging. And then you look at the tree, and it's dying kind of one branch at a time, which is real indicative of some of the native borers. So there's several other uh, native borers that attack ash, uh, but if you do see this serpentine gallery, this back and forth S-shaped gallery, that is the uh, the only insect that would make that in an ash tree would be emerald ash borer. So you've got EAB. So that's just kind of some background on the past. Now we'll get into the management options. Um, so we're talking about managing emerald ash borer in an urban landscape, not necessarily in the woods. There's uh, over 8 billion ash trees in, in the United States. Uh, we're talking about the maybe 100 million or 150 million that are in landscaped areas. In other words, yards uh, along parkways, boulevards, golf courses, um, commercial properties, et cetera. And of course, if we want to decide on our management plan, the first step is to know what we have. Um, so we want to know what our projected costs are. So we'll, 
whether you're managing one ash tree or, or hundreds or thousands, the, the first step is to assess your ash trees. And, and the way to do that is through an inventory, um, measuring the number, the size, the locations, conditions, and your uh, percentage of overall canopy. These are all important things to know. If you're managing one, one tree in your backyard or two trees in your backyard, it's also important to know the, the size of that tree so you can assess your costs, uh, what it might cost to remove the tree, what it might cost to treat the tree. So one of the management options that is commonly used for emerald ash borer is tree removal. And um, assessing the cost is very important. Uh, we know that tree removal can be quite expensive. And uh, uh, by taking trees out, uh, it requires a lot of labor, uh, requires a lot of transportation of material, and that type of thing. And so um, it's oftentimes one of the most costly of the emerald ash borer management options. However, it's the one you read about the most. Uh, people love to read about, uh, love to write about cutting down trees. Uh, they don't often write about treating trees. So it's one that you see that's very dramatic when you see the trucks rolling into the neighborhood and taking out trees. It is quite dramatic. Uh, we do some research on what it costs to remove and replace trees. And from a municipal standpoint, the slide that you're looking at now kind of outlines those costs for a municipality. These are averages, and it can run the gambit from, um, say, $400 at the low end to, you know, $1,500 to remove and replace a tree on the high end. And keep in mind, these trees are on the streets where it's easy to access them by a bucket truck or um, just putting them down into the street. And so on average in the Midwest, it costs between $750 to $800 to remove and replace an ash tree, and that includes all of the uh, the work to cut them down, the uh, the salaries of the people that do it, all the equipment, the transport of the waste, and then reestablishing the parkway or boulevard, and then planting a new tree. And by the way, here in the Midwest, uh, trees are becoming kind of scarce in that two inch, two and a half inch bald and burlap replacement tree size. Um, they are becoming a little bit scarce due to the recession. Uh, some of the nurseries cut back in production, and now the need for trees it does drive the cost up. And so uh, these costs are actually increasing right now for removal and replacement. But important to know that in municipalities, uh, 750 to 800 is an average, but uh, if you have a different situation, it's important to know what those costs are. Private property removals can be much more expensive. Here you see a couple trees near power lines or buildings, and um, those are even more expensive to remove. And so uh, the equation, is the same whether you're a municipality or you're a private homeowner or a homeowner association, uh, knowing what the cost to remove and replace versus the cost of treatment is an important thing to know. And um, just know that when ash trees die, they do tend to dry out quickly and they become unsafe to climb. And so it becomes much more expensive to remove dead ash trees than, it, than live ones. Here's a picture I have of uh, just several trees on the street, and these aren't even that large, but you can see how hazardous of a removal that might be. Um, that's very typical of ash. They tend to um, dry out and split and crack, and so they kind of shatter when they, when they come down. And so nobody wants to climb these trees. Nobody should climb these dead trees, and so therefore the cost goes, goes up, and cleanup and disposal goes up as well. So the, the first component of removal is the cost of removing and replacing, real physical costs, what it cut, costs us to cut the tree, to grind it up, to replace it. The other cost of removal is what we lose. And so here's a picture of a, uh, a street that has a number of ash trees, not entirely ash component, but mostly ash trees along the street. Uh, these trees are fairly mature, and they're some of the only trees that are in the neighborhood are on these parkways. And the, the, the city owns these trees, and, and they decided early on in emerald ash borer uh, management, one of the strategies was to remove these trees, and, and that's what they decided to do. So and not only did it cost them that 750 to 800 to remove and replace, but they also lost the value that these trees provide. And so the day after, the, the street looked like that. And you can see that the yards don't have any trees in them. They weren't really large enough to, to support a tree along with the city tree. And so uh, things changed drastically overnight for the, for the neighborhood. And so 
not only does it cost us money to cut the trees down, but the, the economic benefits that these trees provided are now missing. And it's pretty easy to calculate what those benefits are. There's a great website, treebenefits.com. You can do it for individual trees. There's several cost calculators. We have one at ArborJet that calculates the value of the canopy. And so uh, stormwater runoff is the number one kind of worry for municipalities when they have no tree cover. Uh, more water hits the storm sewers and has to be managed. Property value, very important to the homeowner. On average, property that's well landscaped is worth about 7% more than uh, property with an open area. Um, electricity. Uh, so all kinds of benefits that we're getting from these trees is now gone. And it's going to take 25 or 30 years for that economic value to return. Excuse me. <clears throat> so if you remove 20 trees on a like that, each tree is has an economic value of $150 in annual benefits. That's $3,000 in annual benefits that you're losing every year. If you remove 1,000 ash trees in a community, you're, it doesn't take long to get to millions of dollars of economic benefits that are lost. They're not lost forever. In fairness, uh, that, that street that I took a picture of where um, all the trees were cut down has been replanted. And I took these pictures about eight years ago. I'm going to go back and take uh, another picture with the, the newly planted trees and just to illustrate how long it does take to establish these, these trees and to provide the same benefits. But it's going to take about 20 years to provide the same benefits. So whenever, uh, whenever you're considering removal and, and replacement uh, for emerald ash borer, um, you need to consider the value of the canopy in addition to the cost of removing. So there was actually a couple of uh, research studies done to kind of decide which management option is uh, the most cost effective. And Dr. Richard Hauer from the University of Wisconsin Stevens Point, uh, forestry professor, did a research study. And bottom line is that over a 20-year period, he determined that the most cost-effective approach was to treat your trees rather than remove and replace. Not only would you have spent less money, but you would have an entirely greater canopy value than, than if you do the re, uh, removal and replacement method. There's also been a second study that's, that's proven that out. So bottom line, and again, you can look these up uh, through the International Society of Arboriculture, but uh, the bottom line is that uh, treatment is the most cost-effective approach towards managing ash trees for emerald ash borer. So we'll get into the treatment options. <clears throat> uh, insecticide options since 2002 have been well documented. Since EAB was um, identified here in, in, in our country, a lot of universities have, have gone to work on the on the research to determine what are the best insecticide options for this pest. And so we've got all these kind of um, synopsed in emerald dashboard on info. If you go to that website, you'll find this insecticide options research synopsis, which has several different universities putting together all their best minds and uh, proving out what works best against emerald dashboard. It's a great research um, document. Really, there's three methods that have been researched, tree injection, soil drencher injection, and basal bark sprays. Uh, just to give you some highlights of each, tree injection has a rapid response. In other words, when you treat the tree, the product is up inside the tree uh, doing its job fairly quickly within a few days. Uh, limited off-target effects. Uh, the way that uh, ArborJet treatment methodology works is it's actually sealed inside the tree. In other words, no, uh, no potential for off-target effects. Uh, no waste of products. So you're using a minimal amount of material to uh, the minimum needed amount of material to control the problem. And there's no per acre limitation set on the label by the EPA. Soil drencher injection does require time to reach the target up to six to eight weeks, if not longer, depending on the soil moisture. Uh, there is a limited effect on larger trees. The research uh, does point out a 16-inch diameter tree uh, is often recommended to have a professional injection done, uh, better effects on smaller diameter trees. There's potential for off-target effects. In other words, when doing a, a treatment, 
in the soil, potentially there is an opportunity for that to move off the target. In other words, the tree is the target. You could have other plant material beneath the tree that's not the target. Basal bark spray is rarely used in emerald ash borer since I've been working on it. It was used more in the early days, and we've determined that there are better methods at this point. But uh, there is still that option. And it does have a limited effect on larger trees. It does have a fairly short efficacy. In other words, the material is only effective in the tree for uh, a couple of months. And so that means your timing is very, very critical to make that treatment. And both the soil treatment and the basal bark spray are annual treatments. The injection of triage is a two-year treatment. Uh, just some more information on soil applied treatments. And it is the most common homeowner treatment for folks that were to go to the garden center and buy a product. That would be what they would be buying. It does need to be performed annually, as I mentioned. There is a per acre use limitation. You can no, apply no more than what's equivalent to about four 16-inch diameter trees per year at the 2x, 2x rate, which is the, the professional rate. Uh, the only research options for these soil treatments are the neonicotinoids insecticides. Uh, there is potential for off-target effects and most effective on smaller trees, as I mentioned. One case study that I'm just going to point out, uh, um, Midwest City has utilized all treatment methods. Uh, I'm going to talk about triage trunk injection next, and they have had 0% failure from that, but they have lost trees that they have done with the soil applied imidacloprid, and they have discontinued the dinotephiron bark spray treatments. The trunk injection is... Uh, is the ArborJet method. And so what we do is we actually measure the diameter of the tree at breast height to determine how much material we're going to put into the tree and um, where the injection, the number of injection sites, excuse me. And once we know the diameter, then we determine how many injection sites we're going to put down at the base of the tree near the soil line. And so we'll drill a hole and then we actually put in a small uh, plug. Many of you are familiar with the methodology um, and then once we've got our injection sites placed into the tree, then we're going to come back and put the material into the tree uh, one of several different ways through uh, injection equipment that I'll talk about. So again, we're placing these injection sites near the base of the tree at the soil line or just above, and we're focusing on areas that have good water uptake. We're inserting our arbor plugs into the root flares or areas of taper. And what we're targeting is actually the sapwood of the tree. That's carrying the water up the tree, and that's how we're accessing um, the highway that's already in place that's carrying the water up the tree. We're going to inject our uh, triage into that area. That's going to be carried throughout the canopy into the places where emerald ash borer feeds. So that's the target is the sapwood. We're not targeting the... The heartwood, we're not targeting the, the bark or the cambial area, which is the area of cell division and not an area of conductivity. These are a little closer up of those, that vascular highway, those uh, ethyl elements that carry the product throughout the tree and then distribute it radi radially. That is a photo of our arbor plug well set, and the arbor plug is actually a protect protection mechanism to prevent any kind of air pressure from uh, pushing material outside of the uh, injection site. Also, it seals up that injection site. When we pull the needle out, the rubber center septum seals up and creates a sealed injection site, so all the material that we're putting into the tree stays into the tree. We do have a plug-less injection method. Uh, we've always had one, and it is... Uh, an option if it's a very quick uptake day, in other words, if the tree is translocating very quickly, uh, but you need to utilize a low pressure when you're injecting. And you can use our same equipment, you just need a different tip. So anybody can ask me about the plugless method if they like. Then a couple of studies on what happens to those injection sites after the, uh, the treatment is done. Um, and just uh, in, in order of time here, I'll just cut to the chase. In both uh, studies, it, it indicates that the trees respond very well to the injections, that ash trees are very good compartmentalizers. In fact, the most recent study stated that 
96% of all the injection sites had no decay or any kind of cracking around them whatsoever. So uh, we know this intuitively. I mean, folks have been uh, drilling holes in sugar maples for 100 years, uh, accessing the, the sap for, for maple syrup. I also know here in the Twin Cities where I live, um, there's been hundreds, not thousands, of elm trees that have been treated for the last 40 years with, with uh, great success. The only reason that they're alive is that they've been treated. And so uh, these trees have great ability to compartmentalize and, and manage these injection sites, and it's more known in two studies. That's what you're looking for at uh, after a couple of years at that injection site. I don't know if you can see it in the center. I put a circle around it, but that's the sealed injection site. After a couple of years, the tree grows right around and over that and puts new wood right over the top of it. So when we come back in a couple of years, we're going to actually move over and up, and we're going to put new injection sites uh, into that tree uh, and start the process once again. The material that we're talking about for uh, emerald ash borer control, of course, is triage, and uh, it's been around now for more than 10 years. Uh, it is a two-year treatment. The active ingredient is emamectin benzoate. It's 4% active ingredient, and it's labeled for other pests, but it's very, very effective against emerald ash borer. They have a high sensitivity to this material. It's in the abramectin class of insecticides, non-neonicotinoid. And uh, again, it is only for trunk injection. The research it really indicates excellent, excellent control with emerald ash borer. But it, more than that, there's now hundreds and hundreds of communities and thousands of arborists that have been using it for long enough that uh, I have lived through uh, all the emerald ash borer has had to throw at these trees and, and have seen the success. And I'll talk a little more about that. Whoops, I'm going to go back. Uh, we also have another product, Triage G4. Uh, I should have mentioned that Triage, the original, is a restricted use pesticide. In other words, it's professional use only, and the professional has to show the dealer his license when he buys it, he or she. And uh, Triage G4 is a uh, general use pesticide, and it, it does have the same active ingredient. We've had that in the field now for the last two years. With uh, great success, it does go into the tree slightly faster with the, our IV equipment. It's fairly equal with our injection guns, but uh, slightly faster with our IV equipment. A little less viscous, and uh, I'm told a little easier to clean up in some of the municipal uh, projects that we're doing. So uh, that is also available. Again, been available for two years. The rate is a little bit different, and I'm going to talk a little bit about rates. Um, but there's a little bit more wide discretion in the rates on triage G4 than the original triage. Again, and we do recommend the medium rate with G4, triage G4. Um, it's just where in the medium rate would the applicator want to be. And again, anybody can ask me or their ArborJet representative if they have questions on that. But the medium rate for emerald ash borer is advisable with G4. Again, good control. I'm going backwards. Sorry about that. OK, so we've researched the rates from very low rates to up to 10 milliliters or more per diameter inch. And that's why we know, need to know the diameter of the tree. Uh, we're basing all of our rate recommendations off the diameter of breast height. Um, generally speaking, the two-year confidence uh, at medium rate for most trees with triage or triage G4. Um, some of the researchers do indicate that you are going to have longer residual with higher rates. And there are several researchers that have talked about this. In other words, by putting in a higher rate per diameter inch, you might get longer residual. However, the product is rated for two years, labeled for two years protection at the medium rate. We do have a supplemental guideline there that you can see that um, uh, kind of helps the applicator decide on exactly how many milliliters per, per diameter inch. But uh, generally speaking, we do uh, recommend a lower uh, rate on small diameter trees because the canopy grows exponentially as the diameter grows and slightly higher um, rates per diameter inch as the trees grow in, in diameter. 
But uh, a lot of work went into this, and we learned a lot on how how much material is, needs to be into the tree to control the AB. Just to give you an idea on dose, um, uh, from an environmental standpoint, we're not talking about a lot of volume going into the trees. So on a 17-inch ash tree, you're going to need 75 milliliters to give you two years control of EAD, excellent control, I might add. And uh, so that's two and a half ounces. And if you do the math, that's about three milliliters, which is not even a teaspoon. And that's going to provide you two years of control. And so when you when you're doing that math, you're determining that 4% of the active ingredient is, is well, 4% of the total volume is active ingredient. And so that equates down to 3 milliliters, which is not a lot of product. I've been in the business a long time, treated a lot of trees for a lot of different things, and uh, I'm amazed every day that uh, we're putting so little material inside the tree and getting the complete control that we are. Just to give you a little bit of uh, some some success stories, uh, this is the city of Milwaukee. The city of Milwaukee treats roughly 28,000 ash trees on their parkways. You can see those trees um, right here. There's one there, and then there's another one across the street. Then in the backyard, they don't treat, of course, because they don't own those trees. Some residents decide to treat and some didn't. And uh, you can see some untreated trees in the backyard. And there's one there, and there's one over here in the side yard. So they started treating in 2009, and they had em emerald ash borer had been detected in Milwaukee County, but not within the city city limits. They found it in 2012-13 over the winter, and uh, this is that summer. And we know that emerald ash borer takes about three or four years to build up in population to actually kill these mature trees. So that tells me that EAB was actually in this neighborhood when they first came and injected these two trees in 2009 but it had just started getting into the getting into the area. Well, these two trees are perfect along with their other 28,000, yet the, the backyard trees are, are dead and dying in this picture, and they've had a serious infestation since. So very, very successful there. Um, they've determined, uh, they, they track their records pretty carefully, and so with the 20, nearly 28,000 trees that they treat now, they they have never lost a single ash tree to emerald ash borer out of the 28,000 that they treat. So I can talk about the research all day, but I've got a lot of different um, municipalities and folks treating in heavily infested areas that are having similar results to these. And so to me, this is the real world actual um, what's going on out there. They've also determined that their entire cost, and they do it themselves. So the city staff does all the treatment. We do support them and as do our distributors as far as training, maintaining their equipment. But they do the treatments, and they um, they track all their costs, and they've determined that it costs them about $70 per treatment every time that they go and treat these trees. They're treating them every two years, so that means it, keeps, it costs them about $35 a year to keep those trees alive. So when you go back and look, um, so they spent, when I took this picture, they had spent about $140 in treating those two trees over the last previous four years. They've since treated them two more times. So they now have spent $280 on those trees. It would have cost them $750 to remove each one and replace them. Um, and so they spent a third of what they would have spent already uh, in this particular neighborhood. And all 36,000 of the ash trees that they have in the city are under risk would be gone within the next few years. And so they're very, very happy with their decision. It's been very, very successful, their program. And that's just one of many, uh, many, many, many uh, communities that are seeing success through treatment. So the economics of treatment, just to tie it all back together, uh, we talked about the removal costs. But a tree can be treated for, you know, 20 years or more, depending on if a contractor does it or if the municipality does it themselves, for what the removal cost is. The same equation holds true if you're talking about a homeowner that has a tree in their backyard that might cost twelve or thirteen hundred dollars to remove. They're as old as me, and they don't want to see uh, that tree go because the new tree that's going to be planted in its place is going to never provide the benefits as long as, as they're in that house. And so um, they could treat that tree as long as they're in that property for what it would cost to remove and replace that tree. Uh, this is kind of a graph of that, proving that out. That and 
integrated approach that maintains healthy trees, maybe it removes poor condition trees, is going to save a community money over time. Many, many other case studies. Uh, feel free to reach out to me. I will have my contact information, I believe, here at the end, but or any ArborJet representative has, has this information. But a lot of, a lot of good testimonials from different uh, communities, um, large and small. So again, so we know treatment works. We know it's cost effective. Um, so how do I utilize that tool for what I'm deciding to do? Um, and so it's util utilized differently for the stakeholder. So we can treat shade trees as a contractor. We can treat them every two years for our customers, and we're very confident that we're going to protect them. Um, so we're going to maintain their, their canopy value. Municipalities can treat trees to preserve their canopy. That's one of the goals of many, many cities these days is to um, have multi-species but multi-generational canopies, and they have canopy goals. And so they want to maintain canopy. They certainly want to look where uh, new canopy can be introduced. So tree planting is definitely a big part of most cities' programs, but pre tree preservation is also. Uh, it's a great tool to flatline a municipal budget or even a homeowner association budget. Uh, rather than wait for that death curve to occur to us and have multiple trees die in the next few years, we can flatline those costs and know what our costs are going to be over the next 10, 15, 20 years by introducing a treatment strategy. By introducing that strategy, we can say it's going to cost us X amount every single year to maintain our trees and we're not going to have those budget spikes. Uh, certainly, we know commercial properties can treat. Uh, I did a, a YouTube video maybe five or six years ago in uh, Elgin, Illinois, and it was a commercial property, kind of an office space, multiple buildings, and um, they hadn't done anything with EAB. And that that video got thousands of hits just because it was it was so drastic, the, the dramatic damage that was being caused by Emerald Ashbor in this office complex and how hard it must have been to lease that property when that was happening. And so you can avoid that through through treating trees. Uh, there's programs where you slow the spread um, through, through treatment, um, and there's several different options. I'm not going to get into all the details of all those, but you can do that on a municipal level. There are folks doing that in the forested areas as well to try to slow the spread of Emerald Ashbor. Uh, by selectively uh, treating trees around new infestation sites. Um, you can treat to manage over a longer period of time. In other words, I don't want to have to deal with emerald ash for the next five years, but I want to maintain my uh, canopy through a period of time and plant trees in the, in the interim, and so I can manage this EAB thing over a 20-year period if I utilize treatment. And you can treat to prolong the life of infrastructure, uh, stormwater sewers, things like that. So. Uh, by and large, most communities are in incorporating an integrated management approach now, which is a combination of strategies to fulfill their goals. And uh, knowing that treatment works, knowing that treatment is cost effective has helped them to um, put together a comprehensive strategy through this really huge problem of emerald ash borer, the, the most uh, troublesome forest pest in, in America's history. So we'll talk a little bit about when to treat. <coughs> um, some of you folks are in the Emerald Ash Borer area. Some of you are, might be just kind of on the perimeter. And uh, something that's going on in, in places like South Dakota now, and, and I'm sure in Maine, um, you know, how far away should we be from Emerald Ash Borer when we start to treat? And so, uh, common question. The picture on the right there is a tree that I went and looked at uh, in 2016 in Greenwood, Nebraska. And the Greenwood is very near Lincoln, Nebraska. Omaha announced that they had emerald ash borer, I believe, it was like June of 2016. And then a few couple weeks later, they announced this fine that was 40 or 50 miles away in Greenwood. So I, like a good arborist, raced over there to take a look at this tree. And um, you can see that that tree is very, very infested with EAB. Keep in mind, this is the very first find of EAB in this area. And it had been there at least four or five years. The tree was nearly dead. Um, and so that's something to consider. Emerald ash borer is very, very difficult to detect. Um, so when it is detected, it has usually been there for several years. And preventative treatment is always preferred to a curative treatment. So it's, it's too late for that tree. Um, so we know that. 
we can treat a tree when it has insects in it, but there's a certain point when the vascular system is so disrupted that we can't treat a tree. So, um, again, the current recommendation is, is within 15 miles, but it's hard to detect this insect, and when we do find it, it usually is uh, quite severely infested. So just give you some background on treating infested trees if you are in an area that has EAB now. Um, again, 50% canopy thinning or better is kind of our rule of thumb. Um, and these trees, I took a picture of this just because it was kind of a broad spoke, a stroke of different canopy thicknesses. And the, the tree in the forefront has pretty severe canopy thinning. It's not that I don't think you could save the tree, it's just that the the vascular system is so disrupted that you're unlikely to save all the branches, and so you could have some dieback. Uh, whereas the tree behind it has much thicker leaves, probably not quite as compromised, so you, with a higher likelihood, would be able to get the material throughout the tree and protect that tree. So 40, 50 percent canopy thinning is kind of our rule of thumb. However, I know that people, being people in human nature, they do tend to wait until the last second and um, then call somebody about their tree. And so there's been a lot of people that have been asked to treat trees that are in pretty bad shape. Um, but just know that about 50% canopy thinning is, is kind of our rule of thumb where you have some confidence in protecting it. By the way, just a side note, the trees in the background over here are uh, white ash species. So they're an autumn purple ash. These are green ash species. And that's one thing that we do notice if you have green ash and white ash in your urban forest that uh, they tend to affect the green ash a little bit earlier than the white ash. But then the, they'll polish off the white ash once all the green ash is gone. Um, so here's a picture of, of treating trees that are severely infested, what you might experience a couple of years later. If the tree has been so infested with EAB, some of the branches may be so girdled that the material doesn't move through the entire canopy. And so this is in Darien, Illinois. They began treating after EAB was really established. And some of the trees were had had quite a bit of damage already prior to them treating, but they figured they had nothing to lose. And so they did save the trees. However, there was some pruning required. But always best to treat as a preventative. You can treat uh, as a curative, however, there is some uh, some potential that some of those branches have been so compromised you're not going to get the material in there. Just good to know. Uh, a better success here, this is the first tree in Chicago that uh, EAD was discovered. Again, 40, 50 percent canopy thinning. You can see the unusual sprouts. Uh, this is on 29th and State Street. They treated that tree and then did not treat the trees next to it. Just to see two years later, that's what the treated tree looked like on the left. So you could see that it's recovering. The leaves are getting thicker. Uh, the untreated trees look like that. So two more years is all it took for EAB to polish them off. So great success story on that one. And that tree is still there. I go visit it just about every year when we retrain the city of Chicago uh, forestry employees. By the way, they treat roughly 60,000 ash trees in Chicago. And um, that original tree is still standing and actually looks looks great now that they've pruned out the, the epicarmic branching and that. And um, very, very good investment for the city. Uh, so you get real dependable results, especially as a preventative. Here's I do get asked this all the time, and the reason I put these pictures in there is that what happens if the neighbor doesn't treat or if, if they, you know, some people treat and other people don't. Uh, we're killing the insect inside the trees that are treated. And the trees that are untreated on the left here, you're seeing the untreated tree. Uh, it's declining because the insects are still feeding on that tree, whereas they're not feeding on the treated tree. So you're going to have success whether the neighbor treats or not. Uh, here's the tree from street level. And um, that tree had been treated one time three years prior. Um, I think that's all I have. And I, I don't know, Zach, are we open for questions or? We are. So there is a little chat box, kind of looks like a comic book talk bubble, where if you have a question, feel free to type it in over here. And, uh, if anybody Jeff and has I will, a question, feel Jeff free and to I type it in. Answered. Uh, well, I went through things fairly quick, quickly. I just wanted to make sure that everybody had kind of a broad stroke. I stayed away from the, uh, the politics um, of those kinds of things. Uh, Emerald Ash Borer oftentimes 
we we run into that. We run into maybe not what what's best for uh, the tree, but what's best for um, somebody's uh, special interest. And so I, I try to stay away from that. Um, but that's a com it's a common conversation in the AD. Any questions? All right. Well, thank you very much for attending. I appreciate it. Again, if you have any questions about Emerald Ash Borer or um, management options, certainly reach out to your regional technical manager, Zach, or myself, and we'd be happy to help you.